but uh, my very special thanks are due to two persons. One is Dr. Ken Bhattacharya. You know, uh, his persuasion was the biggest thing to make me travel all the way and come here. And of course, I enjoy this session throughout today. And the other person is uh, Dr. A.K. Tiwari. I think these two gentlemen somehow or other managed to persuade me and uh, I also try to cooperate by organizing my program differently. Uh, it was the suggestion from the forum that uh, I should talk about this subject of concrete deterioration manifestations and mechanisms. Uh, it involves a lot, lot of intricacies of science and chemistry and physics and obviously, you know, within the next 15-20 minutes, I will not really enter into that quagmire. I'll try to make it simple and uh, my, uh, you know, a brief uh, outline of the paper is already in the proceedings so many of the students might read that and otherwise during the breaks or during lunch break you know we can certainly discuss you have certain uppermost in your mind to me concrete is a very mystic material why i say it's a mystic material primarily because it's very simple to make. You ask anybody giving a bag of cement, some stone chips, little bit of sand, and the concrete will be made. In fact, in most of the cases, the concrete will set and harden also. But the most complex thing is to use concrete. Use concrete in a manner that would really lead to a lasting structure. And that's the criticality of the entire concrete science and engineering. If you look at uh, concrete as a material, you know, what is the most striking? That I compared in the morning cement with steel or with aluminium or with glass, the major materials. Now what happens? That you leave steel, if it is properly made, it doesn't really do much of interaction with the environment. If you leave aluminium or glass, uh, it stays on as aluminium or glass. But cement is a material from which the concrete is made and that concrete as a material is a dynamic material. It keeps on changing itself with time. If nothing else you have done, you have left concrete as made. Still it will not be the same tomorrow. It will not be the same after one month. It will not be the same after five years. So it's a material which is intrinsically dynamic in nature. That's number one. And number two is that this is probably the only man-made material, concrete, which does exchange material and energy with environment. Or in other words, you know, it's dynamism with time gets accentuated by its interaction with the environment. These are the two very specific aspects which all of us should bear in mind. So net result of that is that concrete deteriorates. 
come what may, however expert you are, you know, how nicely you make concrete, how skillfully you place concrete, you follow all the uh, Ten Commandments of making and using concrete. Despite all that, concrete will deteriorate. This is, we have to accept in our life. But sometimes it deteriorates in a very adverse manner. <coughs> and why that happens? For four major things. One is that while making concrete, we would not have done the selection and mixing and proportioning of the materials properly. Second is the design and construction. Here I'm not talking about the total design of a structure. I'm talking about the design of construction itself. For example, the kind of joints that we need to provide. The kind of cover to uh, RCC that we need to provide. These are some of the design aspects where we falter and that accentuates or aggravates the durability of concrete. Third important thing is environment. <coughs> Means a lot of things enter into concrete over a period of time during its service life. So that creates problem for concrete. And the last one is the loading. There are umpteen examples where we have not been very rational. You people would have heard long time back some many buildings have collapsed because the roof was used for all air conditioning machines to be put up there. And its loading considerations were not given due attention plus the vibration that it generates. So these kinds of things lead to a problem of loading. So basically there are four elements. One is the material, the other is design and construction, third is environment and loading. Now, Taking all these four together, what we have seen that in reality there are thousands of buildings which their uh, deterioration and damages have been statistically analyzed. And those statistical analysis have shown that materials per se account for only 12% of the all the failures. The major failures come from the constructional details where we have not done the right path. And the third is of course the environmental and loading aspects as I have told earlier. With this what happens? Various types of concrete degradation takes place. For example, you make a porous concrete and this porous, porous concrete is essentially due to improper mix and improper placement during uh, construction. Spalling of concrete due to rusting, that your cover was not right and the, the rebars were exposed and they were all rusted. With rusting there is an expansion and there is falling of the concrete. I'll come in a little more detail little later. Then there are segregation of the concrete. Means you have not really been able to compact your concrete as it should be. So therefore while you place the concrete, the concrete material segregates because it has got an assemblage of materials where particles range from micron size to 20 millimeter in general if you have not gone for even 40 millimeter <laughs> aggregate size. So you are basically using a wide spectrum of particle sizes in concrete and you have not taken care 
then obviously there will be segregation of concrete. Uh, you know, basically the cover concrete I have said, a floor itself, you would have seen many buildings, particularly in earlier years when OPC was the prime binder. These days, a fluorescence is much less because we are using uh, blended cements more. But there also, you would see that white streams around the building, which is due to the calcium salts being leached out. So therefore, there is an efflorescence effect. There are structural damages. For example, on this left side, you can see over Mandavi River in Goa, the, the, the entire bridge got collapsed, which all of you might be aware of. You know, there are similarly the precast concrete where there are uh, damages to the concrete itself. There are seismic damages, which, are, which we are also aware of due to seismicity, which is because of earthquake. You know, they could take various forms, including bending of your reinforcements, or even the column floor uh, articulations and things of those kinds. Uh, there could be even man-made problems of bombing, explosions. They also add to the deterioration of the structures and there could be uh, very harmful things if you are not maintaining your structure. See the picture on the right side where because of the growth of vegetation, the building deteriorates and ultimately collapses. Now, all these damages, I gave uh, quite a few illustrations of that. If you look at that, the major issue is that in the concrete, what is holding the entire concrete? What is holding is only anywhere between say 8 to 15 percent of cement that you have used. And what that cement has done that has really reacted with water and created what we say the hydrated cement paste. And that's the critical part of the entire concrete making. And that hydrated cement base has got two major components. As you can see from this uh, photomicrograph, that you can see that all the solid materials which you are able to see from distance even, and there are some black holes between these solid materials. These black holes are the pores and the solid materials are the products that get generated due to hydration of cement with water. Now, without going into the details, there are several compounds that form with the reaction of water and there are some of these compounds like the calcium hydroxide, we say, or a big name in, uh, in, in cement science, we call it e guide, which is basically a calcium sulfate hydrate. You know, some of these things, they form almost within minutes of hydration of cement. But with time, what happens? These hydrated phases, they do not stay as they form. And over a period of time, what happens that effectively, I don't know, does it have a pointer? Yeah. Does it have a pointer? The center one. Hmm. You know, what happens is that with time, which could be minutes, hours, and days, if you look at that, then what happens that over a period of time, Many of these hydrated phases, they grow in volume. And correspondingly what happens? The porosity keeps on coming down. So ultimately what is very important is 
that this blue portion, this is almost say 100% hydration that you have already tracked and you find that even with 100% you are left with a very large proportion of capillary porosity. And this capillary porosity they bring uh, brings uh, to the fore two important issues. One is what we call as the capillary porosity versus water cement ratio. And the other is permeability versus water cement ratio. Now, what are these two? What is uh, the difference between these two? Very simple that when we talk about the porosity, we are talking about the pore volume within a solid mass. And when we are talking about the permeability, all that we are talking about is that how one material enters into concrete over a period of time. Or how does it penetrate into the concrete? So there is a permeability and there is a porosity. Now if you look at that, the most interesting part is this water cement ratio, which is roughly about 0.36. Why it is critical? Because if you look at the 0.36 water cement ratio, and if you keep on increasing the water cement ratio, there is a steep increase in porosity. Same thing is true in permeability, that same 0.36 water cement ratio, if you look at the permeability, it takes almost a vertical rise with increase in water cement ratio. And this is the most critical part of the entire life of concrete and concrete structures and this entire life of concrete and concrete structures are ultimately guided by a few transport mechanisms in the concrete. What are those? Transport means how an external material will go inside the concrete. What are those? One is of course a simple gaseous diffusion means oxygen, carbon dioxide, how they enter into concrete. Second is vapor diffusion. That means the moisture is moving into the concrete or moving outside the concrete. Absorption and capillary rise means some materials like chloride dissolved in water because it's soluble in water and how that materials enter into the concrete. And last is that by pressure inducement, that how the pressure puts through the fluid through the concrete and basically we are talking about say groundwater, aggressive groundwater which gets into the concrete. And with this what happens in concrete, a few things do happen because of such transport and reactions. What are those? One most important thing is the carbonation of concrete. Second is the reinforcement corrosion. Third is the chloride attack that takes place into the concrete. These three, of course, they are to some extent interrelated. Carbonation, reinforcement corrosion, chloride attack. They are related primarily to rebars or reinforcement steam. Whereas the last two reactions, which we call as the alkali aggregate reaction, and the other is the sulfate attack, they are more related to concrete as a material itself. So there is a distinct classification of the impacts of these reactions into the material. Uh, 
carbonation in terms of chemistry, I wouldn't go into the details, it's a simple sort of thing that there is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, your concrete is not able to hold it back and therefore it gets into the concrete and lime is available, so therefore you form calcium carbonate. So that's why we call it a carbonation reaction. Now, without going into the uh, nitty gritties of this, what happens? That with carbonation, the concrete cover area gets first affected. The concrete cover area, what happens? Under normal circumstances, you have a very fine layer of essentially uh, carbon dioxide there and a very fine layer of iron hydroxide over the reinforcement. And this happens when the concrete, those who still remember a little bit of chemistry, what we call as the pH of that concrete, and that pH remains somewhere close to about 30, 12.6 to 30. In that range, if you can maintain the concrete and the concrete structure over its entire lifetime, nothing would happen to concrete. It would stay very good. But in reality, it does not happen. So, this carbon dioxide embrace into the concrete brings down the pH of the concrete from a level of 12.6, 12.7, it can go down even to close to 8.9 and 9. And in this process, your rebars or steel in the concrete, they get exposed to the environment. And then there is a reaction, what we call as the electrochemical reaction, means the first area where the reaction takes place, we call it anode. And here what happens, that some of the iron becomes iron hydroxide. And this iron hydroxide further reacts and turns into ferric hydrated phase. And what happens, the other side gets charged with the same water and oxygen, but it does not convert into iron oxide and therefore you create a kind of an artificial cell within the concrete itself. And this is one of the fundamental uh, signs of concrete which creates a hell of a problem for all of us. And then the interesting part is that if you look at iron and then you keep on seeing the different oxides and hydroxides forming in the system, then your volume increase can be anywhere up to seven times, mind you. And with that kind of a volume increase, what happens? The concrete cannot withhold its expansion propensity, cracking propensity, and concrete spalls off. And for various uh, environmental conditions, the different oxides and hydroxides are formed. I will not go into the details. Similarly, if you have got chloride from the external sources. Then the chloride will again go into the system and what we call as the iron oxide reacting with the chloride, forming iron chloride as a compound. And then we normally, all the civil engineers would have seen that and they call it pitting corrosion of the reinforcement. Yes it does take place because of this kind of an environment. So ultimately in reality, in life, what happens? That you have got the chlorides on one side, carbonation on the other side, and the combination of this can be dangerous. That if you have got very high chloride, 
and you know the cover depth has already been crossed by carbonation then you are facing or encountering serious problem of damage and deterioration and under different conditions the different risk parameters are there for your structure this is a typical example where the roof has really got damaged because of such reaction the other thing quickly in another uh, two three minutes chairman okay so let me quickly go through that there are many other agencies in the environment which create problem with different construction domains what do i mean for construction domains they are simple things say for example i can have a marine structure which has got a different environment i may have a hydel structure means dams and power houses they have a different structure seawards you heard uh, your former minister talking about the uh, sewage problem the seawards there that's a very damaging uh, material which can affect you very badly and it has happened and happening in our country fourth is of course the industrial and chemical structures fifth structural domain is the water supply conduits and liquid containing structures like that all the structures we can really make them grow into different constructional domains and each of those domains have susceptibility to many of these corroding agents uh, differently they are not the same and i will not go into the detail but i will show you that if you keep your concrete here and ultimately you have all encircled by the different damaging agencies then they form different acids and salts and ultimately they lead to either hydrolysis or different types of reaction mechanisms typically there are three for example you can have hydrolysis or simply the cement base gets washed off or you can have exchange reactions within your concrete system and what does exchange reactions would be in simple terms it would mean leaching of the calcium ions or formation of certain insoluble products in the concrete or substitution of calcium by other elements in the csf structure and the third type is formation of expansive products due to reactions and these expansive products formation will lead to cracks deformation etc and exchange reactions will lead to similar sort of thing loss of mass and loss of strength and alkali silica reaction is another reaction where if you have got high alkalis in your cement and if your aggregates have got some reactive silica then what happens the silicon monoxide ion is i o released from the aggregates they react with the alkalis released from cement and they are counter directed means alkalis move in one side the silicon moves in the other side and they ultimately meet each other but alkali diffusion rate is much higher than the silicon migration rate as a result of this difference there is a huge pressure build up within the concrete system and with that pressure build up what happens that you get uh, damages like this for example this is a typical alkali silica cracking you know although in the 
photomicrograph you see it looks like ganglions, but that's not the case. Here the scale is 10 micron. So you can see that this entire crack is limited to about 10 to 15 micron in size. And that's an amorphous gel, but the system can also generate crystalline gels. And if you have got crystalline gels, you get a rosette-like structure in the al alkalicidic reaction with expansion of the concrete and damage to your concrete. Similarly, in the sulfate attack, what happens? There are three major things that happen. One is the, the sulfate which forms gypsum. That's the simple thing we all in this room we understand. But there could be other formations, what we call is the delayed ytringite formation. This is a much more complex chemistry. I will not take your time. Uh, today with the kind of detailed lathe that we are running. But basically what happens, it's an aggregate sample, it's a quartz aggregate. And you can see that because of the sulfate attack, all these needles you are able to see, these are all the gypsum needles. And this entire aggregate has been encircled by a layer of uh, gypsum. And this gypsum exerts pressure and ultimately your concrete creeps some crack, cracking. You can see the crack here, you can see the crack here, you can see the crack here. So in other words, the sulfate reaction products leading ultimately to the cracking of the concrete. And ultimately we must remember that all that I have said in some form or the other really affects the concrete integrity. And that concrete integrity gets affected almost during the water, uh, construction phase. That concrete integrity might get affected during the construction phase and later on it gets affected during the service phase of the concrete for various reasons. And this crack propensity of the concrete takes us to a very dangerous situation of concrete durability. So in reality, I mean I'll just close, maybe I've exhausted a couple of minutes, the service life is the most important aspect of the concrete. For this service life, you need three things. One is, you need to characterize the material. You need to test the materials properly. And if you have tools and expertise, you go for some predictive modeling of the behavior of the concrete. And all this you do almost simultaneously with the construction starting phase because you need to have a proper cover placed in the concrete. It's not only on your drawing but in reality at site your cover thickness must correspond to what has really been designed for. And Along with cover, two more C's are extremely crucial in concrete durability. One we call as the curing of concrete, the other we call as the compaction of concrete. And all these things have to really confirm to the environmental exposure conditions for your structure, the durability parameters that you have preset, and the concrete specifications that you have drawn. And mind you, in most failure cases, your concrete specification on paper was right, but concrete delivered to the site was not wrong, was not correct. So your specification as done and specification as received, they must also match with each other. 
And as I said, concrete is a mystic material. It's very easy to make, but very difficult to use. Because what you have made so easily, maybe even churning the drum mixer, you know, has to really comply with this entire system for its durability. Otherwise, it will deteriorate, it will damage faster than your normal maintenance would have really taken your material forward. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's the part of the concrete deterioration in very short words. You know, many things might remain unanswered, but please feel free if time permits now or later, whenever we meet. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, thank you for the wonderful. Now I would like to request. Sir, one minute, sir. Yeah. Now I request my chair of the session, Dr. But Mr. Bhattacharya, to present a moment to Dr. Chatterjee for this wonderful presentation. Because the shortage of the time, the question and answer will be during the uh, lunch sessions. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.